In today's video, I'm going to share some tips with you on how to parse your log files into a pandas data frame. We are then going to visualize this data to create different charts, including a scatter plot, a bar chart, and a pie chart. Now, when it comes to log files, there are a wide variety of templates being used in the industry today, and it's impossible for me to cover every single one. However, by following these videos, I hope you'll get a better understanding of how you can parse these log files to identify the exact information you're looking for. So I'm going to split this video into two different parts. So the first part is going to cover a log generated from a serial device, and this device contains multiple sensors. So this log is going to contain temperature, humidity, and gas data from all the sensors that measure this information. So we have the BME688 sensor, the SAD41 sensor, and the ZMOD 4410 sensor. For this case, we have six boards, each containing these three sensors. We want to plot each of these metrics onto their own graph with the data obtained from all six boards. This way, we can identify if the boards have a common point of failure and ensure that all our boards are meeting their expected specifications. And if one board is faulty, it won't affect the rest of the data. To get started with parsing this log file, let's open up the file and see what we're looking at. We can see that each line seems to follow a typical format. But we only really care about these last four values telling us the sensor, the measurement the sensor is reading, the value of the reading, and the timestamp. There are some Python libraries that can help us parse this information, but also consider this line shown here. For some reason, it looks like the serial output frequently glitches, resulting in extra characters on each line. You can still use a parser library to get around this issue, but Python already has a handy library called RE built in. This library is for regular expressions, so we can just build a regular expression to extract the part of each line that we need. We're going to place the code for parsing all the different log files into its own file called parsers.py. In this file, we're going to import the RE module, which helps with regular expressions. First, define the pattern to be used to find the relevant information in each line of the log. We only care about the part after the inf main present on each line, so we'll add this to the start of the string. In each line, we care about the sensor, reading, the value of the reading, and the timestamp. To easily obtain this information, we can use Ari's search function. This looks through a string to see if the regex pattern can be found within the string, and if so, we have a match. In the pattern, we can specify capturing groups to identify which part of the text corresponds to what value, and we create these groups by adding question mark p to our regex pattern. So first we have the sensor, which is a string, so that regex can be given by question mark p, sensor in brackets, and then a dot asterisk. Then the reading, which is also a string, so it can also be given by question mark p, a value in brackets, and dot asterisk. Next we have the value, which can be a floating point number, and to represent a floating point number in regex, we can use the following. Lastly, we have the timestamp, which is an integer, so the regex is simply given by question mark p, timestamp, and then we can use a backslash d plus to represent all numbers. Now that we have a pattern we can use for our research function, we're going to create another function called parse serial, which is going to take a file path as a parameter. Inside this function, we're going to specify an empty data array to hold the data of each line, and we're going to open the file as a read-only object. Now we're going to loop through each line in the file, and we're going to call re search function and we're going to store it in a variable called match. So we pass in the pattern and the current line as the arguments of the function. And if we have a match, we want to extract the capturing groups that we previously defined. So first we'll get the sensor using match.group. And then I'll copy this line, create three more copies. And then rename this one to be reading. Get the reading group. This one will be a value, get the value group, and lastly we have the timestamp. Okay, so now that we have all the values, let's add this to our data array. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a row, and we're going to specify it as a dictionary. So inside each row we have a sensor, we have the reading, we have the value, and then we have the timestamp. So now that we have the row defined, we'll append it to our array. Say so data.append row. And then at the end of this function, just return the data. Now, before I can declare this function as complete, there's still one more consideration we have to take into account. The time is currently given as a Unix timestamp, but we're more interested in seeing how the values change over time. So we're more concerned with knowing the time passed since the start of the test. So we'll create a new variable called base when we open the file, and we'll use this as our reference timestamp. So if our data array is empty, 
check over here if we have nothing inside the data. Then we'll set our base value to be this current timestamp. So our reference time is the first timestamp that we encounter. Then over here, we'll create a new time. Uh, and we'll create a function called time to duration. We'll just pass in this current timestamp and the base timestamp. And then we'll return the difference between the both of them. But this difference is given in milliseconds, so we need to divide it by 1000 to get it back into seconds. Then back in parse serial, we'll set time to be equal to the return value of this function, as in the current timestamp and the base timestamp. And then inside our row, we'll change that to be time. And that completes the parse serial function. So now that we have our parsing function set up, we're going to create a new file called serial.py. And in this file, we're going to focus on the visualization aspect. So for each file that we parse, we're going to create a pandas data frame to hold that parse data. To start, let's focus on our log files and putting them into the parser. So we have six log files obtained from six different devices in this directory, logs backslash serial, and you can see the files are labeled from com3 to com8. Now back in serial.py, we'll import the modules that we need for this file. So we have the OS module, the pandas module, pyplot from matplotlib, and then the parser that we just created. Now inside our main code, we're going to define a constant first. We'll call this constant logs underscore dir, and this specifies our target directory. Now what we want to do is loop through all the files present in this directory, and we can do that using the os.listdir function. So we pass in our logs directory as the argument, and then inside this for loop, we're going to open the file using os.path.join. So once we have this, we're just going to verify that it is a file by using the os.path.isfile function, and then we'll call parse serial that we defined earlier. Store the result of this in a variable called result. And now I want to mention that this function returns an array of key value pairs where each entry contains the same keys. So it's almost like a table. We're going to create a pandas data frame using this result variable. And then I'll print this data frame to show you what I'm talking about. So looking at this data frame, we can see that pandas does actually convert our original data into a table. The main benefit of doing this is that the library also contains a lot of methods to make it easier to obtain specific sections of the data or to modify multiple entries in the data. This saves a lot of time and effort that would otherwise be spent looping through each entry in the array. I'm going to remove this print statement now and what we're going to do is store each file in a data frame and then store all of these data frames into their own array. Like I said before, we have data collected from six devices, so we have six data frames in total. We're going to store this number in a variable called end devices so we can use it later. Parsing files takes a bit of time, so if you're running this as an actual program, you might want to know which file is currently being parsed so it doesn't look like the program is just frozen. What we're going to do in this for loop is modify it to use enumerate, so we'll change it to be for idx file in enumerate and then put the os lister inside that. And then after we'll print which file is currently being parsed by using this idx value. Each of these data frames contains information for the SCD, BME, and ZMOD sensors. We want to plot the data from each of these sensors onto different figures, but first let's start by extracting the sensor data from each data frame. First, we'll create the ZMOD figure. Create a function called extract ZMOD data with a parameter called DFS. The ZMOD sensor contains readings for IAQ, TVOC and CO2. So to find some empty arrays for these entries, loop through each data frame and using the LOC function available on our pandas data frames, we're going to extract every entry where the sensor is equal to ZMOD and the reading is IAQ. We're then going to append this to our IAQ array. So this IAQ array is going to hold the ZMOD IAQ data from every COM port. So we'll have six data frames in this array just containing ZMOD IAQ data. Then duplicate these two lines and we change them to take the CO2 and the TVOC values. At the end of this function then, we'll return these three arrays that we just created. With the extract ZMOD data function being complete, let's go back into our main code and actually call this function. We'll call extract ZMOD data and store the result into three variables, ZMOD IAQ, ZMOD TVOC, and then ZMOD CO2. So we'll call this function and we'll pass in all our data frames as the argument. Okay, then at the bottom here, we'll call plt.show so that matplotlib actually shows all our figures. 
and then we're going to create a function for plotting the Zmod data. So over here under our extract Zmod data function, we'll create another function called plot Zmod, and we'll pass in four parameters. So we have n, iaq, tvoc, and co2. n is just the number of data sets that we have. So we'll start by preparing our figure, and we'll do this by calling plt.subplots. We want three subplots on our figure. We want them all to share the same x-axis, and then we'll specify our figure size to be 79. This just makes it so that there's a bit of padding in between each figure so that they all look cleaner. Next, we'll set our title to be zmod4410 readings, and then we'll call plt.subplotsadjust to add some padding between the top and the bottom of the window. So we'll add some top padding of 0.94, and then a bottom of 0.06. Now we'll actually plot our data. So what we'll do is that we'll loop n times, and then we'll plot each of the IAQ, CO2, and TVOC data present in each data frame. So we'll call IAQI.plot, passing the following arguments. So we have X, Y, the X label, and the Y label. And then we have the actual label, which is gonna appear on our legend. And we're going to set this to be the COM part that it corresponds to. We're going to take our I iterator and increment it by 3, because remember that we have data from COM3 to COM8. And we'll specify our legend to be in the upper right corner, and then we'll copy this line, and paste it two more times, change it to be for our TVOC, and CO2. And once we do that, we also want to change our labels, change the Y label to be TVOC here, and then CO2. And then back in our main code, we can call this function. We'll call plot zmod, passing in n devices, zmod iaq, zmod tvoc, and zmod co2. Okay, then before we run this, we need to specify which axes these correspond to, because we want all the iaq data to appear on one graph, all the tvoc data to appear on a separate graph, and so on. We'll specify iaq axes to be the first one, tvoc the second one, and then co2 the third one. So if we run the code now, we can see that all our uh, readings appear on this figure over here. And one thing you might notice is that the data after 40,000 seconds appears to be kind of useless because it seems like some of the devices just stop working at that time. So we can specify a limit so that we only look at the relevant data, which will make it look a little bit less congested and make it easier to identify trends. Over here, we'll specify an xlim. We'll specify to show only data from 0 to 40,000 seconds. And we'll have that on all the axes. Now if we run the code again, we can see the trends are much more visible now and we can see a much more common pattern than we could before. It looks like COM8 is a bit of an outlier, but we can see the rest of the data seems to follow a similar trend. To get the SED data, we're just going to follow the same procedure we did for the Zmod sensor, so we can just copy over the code that we have for Zmod and make it for SED instead. So to start, we have the extract SED data function, and recall that the SED sensor contains readings for temperature, relative humidity, and CO2. So when you extract T, RH, and CO2 data from the data frames, and then return these arrays. Once that function is done, we're going to create a plot SED function. So we'll just copy the copy row for Zmod again, but this time we're going to change the variables and labels we had previously defined to use our new SED variables. Back in the main portion of our script, we'll call these two functions. And then if we run the code, we can see how our figures look like. So we have two figures generated, one for the SED and another for Zmod, and we can see how these graphs change over time. We can see some random fluctuations suggesting that these sensors may have glitched during this time, but overall all our devices are following the same trend, which is a good thing. Last but not least, we have the BME688 sensor, and again we can just copy over the code from Zmod, but this time we have 10 values obtained from this sensor, so we're going to have to change this to include 10 arrays instead of 3. So we're going to define 10 variables and have 10 empty arrays, and then we're going to extract these 10 values from our data frame. Now when we're plotting the BME sensor, we have 10 graphs to display instead of 3. So to fit them all into one window, we're going to create a 2x5 grid of subplots. And to make sure the data appears correctly when the window is open, I'm going to set the fix size to be 17x9. Then we're going to call subplots that adjust again to add some padding, but we're going to add some padding in the horizontal direction too this time. I also added this fig.tight layout call to add some more padding between each graph. Now we'll plot all the data in a for loop similar to how we did for the other two sensors. 
In our main section, we're going to call these two new functions that we defined and then run the code. One other thing you might notice with the BME graphs is that the values on the y-axis are quite large, so they kind of take up a lot more space than we would want. So one way we can condense this is to use scientific notation on the y-axis. Back in our code, we're going to add two lines to change the two graphs that have these large y-values so that these values are going to be expressed in scientific notation instead, and thus that reduces the amount of space that both graphs take. We can see now that all the data we wanted to plot on the graph appears cleanly on a single window for the BME sensor. We can look at these figures closer to make sure that the data from each device is following the same trend, and that there are some points of interest where it looks like the devices have a common point of failure. Visualizing this data is extremely useful for us as we can disregard faulty data easier. We can identify trends present and we can identify unexpected power cycles or errors. Thank you for watching this video. In the next one, I'm going to cover parsing logs for Android devices and GPS data, so stay tuned for that. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe, and if you have any questions or feedback, feel free to leave them in a comment down below, and I will see you for the next one.